Hi guys, in this video, I'm going to talk about mixed models, linear mixed models, and also generalized linear mixed models. Um, this is a very hard topic, at least for me. I used these books in uh, researching for this topic, uh, Generalized Estimating Equations by Hardin and Hilbe, which I also used for the previous video, uh, Foundations of Linear and Generalized Linear Models by Agresti, and this book called Linear and Generalized Linear Mixed Models and Their Application by Jiming Jiang and Thuan Nguyen. I don't know how to pronounce these names, I'm sorry. Okay, so what are mixed models? Um, we again talk about a scenario where we believe our data to be coming from groups. So um, it could be repeated measurements of the same individual, what is called longitudinal, longitudinal, what is called longitudinal analysis. And it could be that we are just taking samples coming from hospitals or medical centers or families. Okay, so we believe there is some correlation within each family, within each medical center, etc. So this was what we had also in the GE. Um, what are linear mixed models and generalized linear mixed models? So the linear models, we had three assumptions that the observations are IID, that they uh, distributes, the response distributes normal, and that the mean of the response is some uh, linear function uh, of some data that we have, some covariates. In the generalized linear model, we expanded this and we said it doesn't have to be only a normal distribution, it can be anything from an exponential family, meaning it can be a Bernoulli distribution, it can be a Poisson distribution, etc. And we also said it doesn't have to be that it doesn't have to be that the mean is directly related to the covariates. It could be some function of the mean is the linear function of the covariates. Okay, when you move to linear mixed models, you drop the assumption that they are IID. You assume that there is some group correlation. There is some correlation within a group, but there it, group, between groups, they are independent. And given that you know uh, this, what is called random effect in linear mixed models, given that you know that you say that for this group, there is this extra random effect that we denote here with U, then given that you know it, then uh, it distributes normal uh, with a mean, and the mean is just the, what was the previous uh, function of the covariates plus some random effects that could have their own covariates as well. And you also assume in the linear mixed models that the random effect distributes normal with a mean zero and some uh, variance. When you go to generalized linear mixed models, you it's exactly like linear mixed models, only again, but again, it doesn't have to be that the response, even given that you know what is the random effect, distributes normal, it can distribute anything in the exponential family. And again, you have a link function. It doesn't have to be that it's the identity. It can be that some function of the mean is equal to a linear uh, combination of the covariates plus the random effect. And here you don't have to assume that the random effect distributes normal. It can also distribute something else. A general question that might arise is why do we even need random effects? Why not just use uh, fixed effects? Why not say that you know, for each group, we give it some fixed effect, some extra beta, and we model it like this. Well, the problem is that you probably you can't really quantify uh, the difference between groups. You can't say, ah, this family is different from this family in some order, in some structure. What you will end up doing is that if you have, for example, n people in a longitudinal research, or, um, or you have n groups, and like n families, you end up giving each of them its own dummy binary variable. So you will end up with n minus one binary variables. And if you have a lot of clusters, if you have a lot of groups, this is not very practical. So instead, we use this random effect uh, system and we assume that the variation between groups is random. 
Okay, so before we go into GLMM, let's first talk about uh, LMM, linear mixed models. So again, we assume this random effect for each group uh, distributes IID. Yeah, so here it's IID. Yeah, with some mean zero and a variance G. And UK can be one dimensional, for example, in a random intercept. Okay, it can just be one dimensional. Uh, but it can also be d-dimensional. For example, if you have a mix of uh, random intercept with random uh, slope, if we write it down, then yki uh, is equal to some function of the covariates, some linear function of the covariates, some random effects, and some noise. The mean of this, given that we know u, is just this. Right, because the noise is normally distributed with a mean zero and some variance, sigma square. Given that we know u, uh, y distributes normal with this and some variance uh, from the epsilon that we'll just denote by r. So z can be the same covariance as x subset, something completely different for the most simple uh, and maybe the most common model is the random intercept where z is just equal to one, okay? So what we actually have is this equation, which means if we add b not with u, it's this. So we only have a difference in the intercept between the groups, okay? Between the families or between the people, okay? But we can also have a random slope model where we say that the z is x1, is the same values as x1. And then what we will have is this kind of uh, a model. So, so the groups differ by their slope. So each group will have a different slope in a 2D case where you only have one covariate. You can also have a mixed, you can have different intercept and different slope, and you can have something also completely different. You can have some other measurement that you have for each uh, observation, and you say that the random effect is depending on this other measurement. If we move to matrix form, then U can either be a scalar or a vector, depending on how much Zs we have on um, how much random effects we have. And why given U, uh, let's talk about a single group right now, will distribute normally with X beta plus ZU, okay? And some uh, variants are, uh, which capture, we can, which can also capture the um, dependence within group. Okay, so how do you fit the betas here? This is of course true for every group. And since u is normal and epsilon is normal, then what we get is that y distributes normal with this and this variance. So why is that? Well, we have basically this random variable plus this random variable, and a Gaussian plus a Gaussian is a Gaussian. The mean of the sums is just the sum of the means, but this is a constant. Uh, the mean of this is zero, and the mean of this is zero, so we are end up with this. The variance, well, it doesn't depend on x on this constant. It's just the variance of this plus this. Here it's a matrix times either a vector or a scalar, depending on the dimension of the random effects. And here we have that this is R. The reason we could break this down is also because we are assuming that the random effects and the noise, the epsilons are independent. This is how we get to this. And we can write this whole thing simply as V of K. And notice that this time uh, it doesn't have to be diagonal anymore. In fact, it won't be diagonal, right? Uh, we will see this in a second. So, we can write this for each group, or we can write it for the entire data vector, uh, denote this by V, and the V will be a block diagonal matrix, right? So V will have some block here, and some block here, and some block here, and some block here, where this is V1, and this is V2, and these are the Vks, right? For the, each cluster. And here, everywhere else, it's zero. Okay, and V, is parameterized usually by some uh, parameter theta. We don't assume that V is a, uh, an entire matrix of unknowns, yeah? V is a covariance matrix, and we assume some structure so we can only uh, use less parameters. So we assume it's parameterized by some vector of parameters theta, 
And the easiest case is if I take R to be just sigma one squared times the identity matrix, basically I'm saying that the noise uh, doesn't give me any uh, dependent structure. The ZK will be a vector of one as length as the number of observation in our group. So basically I'm assuming a random intercept model. And so uh, G will just be a uh, scalar. It will uh, be sigma two square. And then if I calculate the VFK, I get, get this matrix over here. Notice that if I take the correlation between KI and KJ to observation in the same cluster, I get that this is their uh, correlation. And why is that? Well, for each uh, element in the IFJ, I will get uh, sigma u uh, square, right? And the standard deviation of each one of them is just the square root of this. And the square root times the square root becomes uh, without the square root. And we get this. So we get a positive correlation. And notice that in this case, VK only have two parameters. Our theta is just two parameters. It's, it's sigma u and sigma epsilon. Uh, maybe we could also make it more uh, difficult. We can maybe assume an R, which has this kind of a structure. So we assume some other uh, structure uh, also coming from the epsilon, not just from the u. Uh, and then uh, if we calculate now, we will get this matrix. We will get this structure. And here we will have an extra parameter. Yeah, we will also have this row. Um, the main point is that uh, V will be non-diagonal. The VK, if we move to a uh, representation of our entire data uh, across all groups, then V will be a block diagonal matrix. And that it won't be that we have n by n parameters. We will only have some uh, small set of parameters that we denote theta that parameterize the covariance matrix. Okay, so we can write the likelihood since we know the distribution, we can, we can write the log likelihood. It will be this thing plus the constant that doesn't depend on anything on any of the parameters here. We can now differentiate with regards to the beta and also with regards to theta. And we get a set of equations where that we solve numerically. So if we differentiate it with regards to the beta, we get this equation, which is quite uh, known. Uh, the only problem is that we don't know V. V depends on the thetas. So we also have to differentiate with regards to theta. Here we do a differentiation of a scalar uh, by a matrix element. And there are formulas for that. Uh, you can check matrix calculus in Wikipedia. They have uh, all the formulas. So for uh, differentiating the ln of the determinant of V, I use this formula and we get this. For the differentiating of this, I have to use both this formula, this identity and this identity, and then I get this. And the important thing is that we get a set of equations and we try to optimize them. We try to, uh, they are not linear, so there is no closed form solution. But there are numerical algorithms, for example, newton raphson which also requires the hash end, so we will have to differentiate again. Uh, or we can use gradient descent. This is regular maximum likelihood. We try to get to the maximum of the log likelihood function. There is an alternative approach called, called REML. And the thing is that the ML estimate of V is biased. So remember, for example, in the 1D case, we got that the expected value of our MLE estimator of sigma square is equal to this thing over here. You see it's biased, it's not exactly sigma square, it's almost. It's usually not a problem as n goes to infinity or at least grows large enough, the bias vanishes. Maybe if we have too many p's, so too many dimension for our data, then this will be our bias and maybe it might pose a problem for small data sets. But in regular linear models, we can simply correct for it. Notice that here, what we get in the maximum likelihood equation is a numerical solution. We don't really have a, an, an analytical form. We just have the, the values of the beta and the values of the sigma. So we can't really correct for this biasness. Uh, and this is why uh, there is another approach. And the thing is to note that if I knew 
uh, v. So if I could get a non-biased estimator of v, then I would just plug it in in the first equation here, yeah, and solve it, yeah. And then I, the, if I know v, the uh, solution for the first equation is really easy. Um, so the way this is done, the way you estimate V is by a method called REML. It's either residual ML or restricted ML. Uh, it has a few names. And the idea is to apply a transformation to the data to eliminate the betas. And then this way you can estimate V directly. So A needs to be a transformation matrix of rank N minus P such that AX is equal to zero. One example of this is this matrix over here. And notice that if I now I transform the data and take AY, I will get this and this. Yeah, if I do this pair uh, cluster or pair group, but AX is zero, so this disappears and we get this. And now if I look at the log likelihood of this new data, it's this thing over here. If I, uh, there is no betas, as you can see, a is a known matrix. I know how to compute it. And if I differentiate with regards to the thetas that parameterize the V, then I get this equation over here. Again, I use the same um, identities from before with minor adjustments. So I get this thing. I equate it to zero. Again, these are not so nice equations, but I can solve this with newton raphson or gradient descent. Um, assuming that I got the optimal solution, then the thetas that are that I get from here will result in a variance covariance matrix that is not biased. So this will solve the biased uh, problem from before. And then once I have this V parameterized by the theta, I just plug it in here and I get the estimators for the, for the betas. Once I have the betas and the V, I can use them to predict the use. So sometimes maybe you want to know, give some estimate of what will be, what is the random effect per group? We do this by noticing that uh, if we uh, append the u to the y to the data, it will distribute normal with mean x, beta, and zero. And the covariance matrix, will, we just have to compute the covariance between y and, and u, right? The covariance between y and y is just v. The covariance between u and u is just g. And here g, uh, in the case where we have only one random intercept u, it will be a diagonal matrix uh, with the size of the number of groups that we have, right? So suppose we have n by one vector for y and m groups, so m by one vector for u, it will distribute normally. And yeah, this will be also an n plus m vector where we, you have x beta here and zero here. And here you will have n by n, uh, g will be m by m, be n by m times m by m. And here you will have g, z transpose. The g doesn't have to be transpose because it's already uh, symmetric. Okay, so, and the way you get to the covariance of y and u is simply by this calculation, which gives you z of g. Remember, we assume that epsilon and u uh, are uncorrelated, so their covariance is zero. And if we have more than just a random intercept, then maybe we have to um, collapse it into a vector. Maybe we will have uh, 2m by 1 or 3m by 1, depending on how much random intercept we have. And this will change also our g. And G will maybe now be um, a block diagonal matrix. And once we have this, then uh, it's not a problem to get the conditional, given that I know why, what is U. Uh, we know how it distributes. It distributes like this, using a conditional distribution of, mul of multivariate normal. And then I can just give an estimator of U to be the mean. Uh, here, where I use the estimators for the beta, estimators for the V, and estimator for G uh, in the calculation. Uh, another thing you could do is estimate the betas and the U's simultaneously. 
this looks instead of the marginal of y, it looks at the joint of y and u, it breaks it down to this, uh, which is proportional to this, which is equal to this. And now I can differentiate once with regards to the beta, get this, once with regards to u, get this. Uh, if I rearrange the terms, I get this and this. And these are known as Henderson's equations. I'm not really sure how to fit them. Uh, I read that uh, you can use EM type of algorithms since you also have the u's and the betas. Uh, you somehow have to estimate the r and the g, meaning the thetas that parameterize these variance, covariance matrices. Again, I'm not sure exactly how it's done. You should, if it's interesting, you should check it out uh, yourself. I want to move to GLMM, generalized linear mixed models. And so the difference from moving from LMM to GLMM is, again, instead of having that uh, normal distribution, you could have any distribution from the exponential family. Instead of saying that the mean is directly a linear predictor of uh, the betas plus the random effects, some link function that links the mean to the linear uh, predictor is in play. And here you don't have to assume that u is normal. You can assume u to be any kind of distribution that you want. In a random intercept model, you will have this. So again, this the only difference is in the intercepts of this linear predictor. But more generally, you would have this. So in order to get the likelihood, we have to break the joint and take the integral over the joint, and we get this thing. OK, if we look at the likelihood, it will look like this. And this expression is just a regular GLM. But given that I know u, I have some offset term, yeah? Because I know the z, I know the u. So I just have some offset term that I plug into the regular GLM. Uh, and note that u now is multivariate, right? It's the number of clusters times the number of, number of effects. So suppose we only have one effect, a random intercept. And suppose we have 10 clusters, then uh, what we get is like as if we are sampling uh, from a multivariate but independent, uh, we get a vector of 10 values, right? Some distribution, let's say normal. So we uh, sample from uh, a normal distribution with uh, the diagonal covariance matrix, everything is independent, but we sample 10 points because for each group for each cluster, for each of our 10 cluster, uh, we will have a different number. So we have to integrate over all the possible values that we can uh, draw for all the possible uh, clusters. So the log likelihood is just the log of the integral. And this is breaking down to all of this, OK? Uh, and notice I now parameterize it by the cluster um, index, the k, because as I said, we have to draw for each cluster a different number, times the distribution of uk duk. OK, but since we said the uk are independent, we can switch between the integral and the product. And we get this. And the ln of the product can be converted into the sum of the lungs. OK, and this is what we are end up with. For example, in the logistic regression with a single random intercept random effect, then this is our random effect, right? And the equation would be simply this. Uh, and if we change uh, the integral and the product and then turn it into a line, we just get this. So you see, the likelihood is quite formidable. Uh, so what you do usually uh, maybe this integral is too hard to compute, and maybe you can't even compute it analytically. So you have to somehow approximate it. There are a few methods, for example, Gauss-Hermite quadrature, Laplace's method, Monte Carlo methods, etc. Et the approximation still gives you uh, a function of the coefficients and the parameters. So you still have the betas and the sigmas, yeah, that parameterize you. Uh, in the approximation. And then once you have these uh, approximation, you can differentiate and you can use newton raphson gradient ascent, et cetera, to solve these equations and get um, an estimator for these parameters. 
In Hardin and Ilbe's book, uh, they give an example uh, of a Poisson regression, both without approximation and with a gauss hermite approximation. It's in chapter two, section at 2.3.2.3. And for the exact, again, we assume a Poisson regression. The link function is the log function. Uh, and so log of u is some linear predictor. When you move to a random effect model, then the log of mu tilde, let's denote it mu tilde to distinguish, uh, is this thing over here. But the inverse of this is just the exponent. And notice that we get the exponent from before, from the regular uh, GLM model, times this e of u that I can denote with the parameter nu, okay, which looks a bit like a v. So uh, instead of assuming a distribution of u, I can assume a distribution of e of u, meaning of nu. And what they did, they assumed it's a gamma with uh, the alpha and beta parameters equal to the same parameter, which they denote theta. And then this is their uh, PDF for this gamma. And if we want to calculate now the log likelihood, well, if we focus on this equation, it's just equal to this. And since gamma is the conjugate prior of a Poisson, if we have a Poisson likelihood, then we get the resulting distribution of this is also gamma with these parameters. Okay, so you can see this here. I just uh, take everything out of here that doesn't depend on new outside of the integral. Uh, I get, I'm left with this inside the integral. Since this is a gamma, since this is a gamma form, I simply uh, know that this is equal to the normalizing constant. Uh, this I take out, it's just a constant and doesn't depend on any of the parameters that we have. We are left with this. And then if I take the sum of the log of this, I'm left with this. You can also uh, deconstruct it into uh, sums of logarithms instead of uh, all these products. Uh, but it doesn't matter. Uh, you can now differentiate it with regards to the betas. And you might ask yourself, well, where are the betas? The betas are, of course, in the mu's. So you have to differentiate with regards to the mu's and then the mu's with regards to the beta. And you can also differentiate it with regards to theta, which is the only parameter that we added uh, to the model. And you equate these to zero and you get, you solve it and you get the estimator for these parameters. For the approximated version, uh, they said instead of u being gamma, they let u be normal with some variance. And they use a Gauss-Hermite uh, approximation. They arrive at this equation where uh, the sum over m is the sum over the estimation points in this algorithm, which I won't go into. And these are also weights and some values uh, that you get from this approximation. Rho is a function of the variance uh, of u, and uh, this uh, big F is a scary function. So the, the main point uh, that I'm showing you this is that in the new approximated log likelihood, you still have the betas and you still have the uh, sigmas or the thetas, however you want to call them. Yeah, so the, this approximation of the integral and as of such of the log likelihood, yeah, this is the log likelihood, um, then it's still a function of betas and theta. You can now differentiate it with regards to them and solve them. And in chapter three of their book, they also give a general form, right, for the GLM, and not just for the Poisson, but in general. So remember that our general form for GLM is once we have the likelihood and we differentiate it, we got to this form uh, in matrix notation. Okay, and we said that if we have if we have group correlation, so within group correlation, this can be broken down into uh, this sum over all groups of these different matrices. In the GEE, we changed the variance structure directly and we changed it here. But he, uh, in GLMM, uh, we assume something else, right? We assume that if I know the U, then 
expected value of y given u is simply this, right? If, if we take a random intercept model. So now if I want to know what is the mu, I just have to take the expected value of this with regards to mu, right? Which is also called the law of total expectations. So I have to take the integral of this quantity times the distribution of u at du. Okay, so this is how I have to change the u and I have to change it and I have to change it per x. So for the cave cluster and the i observation of the cave cluster, I will get xki uh, times this plus uk fuk duk. Okay, and uh, the, the uk is not so important here because we said it's independent uh, between the clusters. We could just write it as u here because uh, it's iid between clusters. Okay, so this is how we change the mu. But how do we change the variance? It also changes. So by the law of total variance, we have this uh, formula over here. If we look at the variance of y given u is known, it's simply, uh, well, it's just the regular variance in the GLM, right? It's just some phi times the variance um, mu relation, variance mean relation. So if we do this, and now we have to, uh, plug it in here, then the phi goes out and we are left with an integral of this quantity times the distribution of u. Okay, so some uh, expected value, some weighted average of this over all the possible values of u. Okay, and v, the variance mean relationship, I'll just remind you, it's, for example, in the normal, it's just equal to one, but in the Poisson, it's equal to mu, right? Etc. Now, this we also know, we know it's just this thing over here, but now if we take the variance of this, then we have to take this minus the expected value of this, which we already saw, it's equal to mu, and then take it, uh, the square of this, multiplied by f u. Okay, but this is only for the variances. Remember, we want to have a covariance matrix um, between two observations in the same cluster. So there's also the law of total covariance where the law of total variance is a um, special case of, uh, which is this thing over here. We assume that given the mu k, uh, the covariance here is zero if i is different than j. So if I know u, there is no extra dependence between uh, two points in my uh, cluster. Uh, the covariance between two points is only coming from the U. Okay, and uh, uh, so this thing will be zero in the covariance matrix outside of the diagonal. And this thing can be written for any two points that are not on the diagonal like this. And putting it all together, we get this thing over here where I put here the indicator variable where we only had this part if uh, we are on the diagonal. Now this is further simplified using a Taylor approximation and you also estimate the um, variance parameter and uh, phi from the data, I won't go into it. The main point is that our new V is a function of all these things and is no longer diagonal which kind of makes sense since our model should result in within group correlation. Okay, and similar to quasi likelihood and G, it's also possible to use robust sandwich estimator uh, in the case that maybe we didn't specify our model correct and we are getting wrong variants, but I won't go into that either. I want to conclude with what is the main difference between G and GLMM. So, um, G is what is called population average in the Hardin and Ilbe's book. You uh, take the mean of their response across all the groups and uh, the betas that you have, they represent the average over the entire population. In the GLMM, which is called uh, subject specific G, you model the conditional distribution, right? Of uh, Y given some U, and uh, u is some random effect that you add to your linear predictor. And some function of mu is equal to this thing now. So notice that the betas mean different things in this model. And a very good uh, graph that shows it 
is a logistic regression with a random intercept versus a marginal model. So in, so in the full line, you have the GLMM uh, where you have different intercept for different groups. So the, what the different intercept does is just shifts the uh, probability lines, okay? The, the regression line here. It shifts the sigmoidal line uh, forward and backward. But in the marginal model in G, what you do is you take this average across this. So uh, the beta one in the GLMM will be probably higher than the beta one in the G, because in the G, it will be average across the entire population. So as you can see, this is not an easy topic. I hope you found this useful and that I didn't make any mistakes. Uh, that's all for this video. See you in the next one.